Hello, everyone. My name is Sharzad Kiare. Welcome to Not My Circle, a conversation series where I chat with people that are not in my normal circle. I hope you guys are loving this series. And if you are, I would love a review, a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you're getting this content. I would love if you could leave a rating or review because it helps the podcast do better and that helps me, and then I can keep going. Today, I have an amazing guest. Her name is Florida Yacob. She is an Eritrean refugee, and she has one hell of a story. So I hope you guys enjoy. We'll start, if you're ready, with um, what did you have for breakfast today? Um, Good question. I had a smoked salmon with some bagels and some vegan bacon but the bacon wasn't so nice because I think it it didn't taste like meat whatsoever. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's, that probably sounds like my favorite breakfast of anybody so far though. I eat a, I I have tried a lot of the vegan meats. Some of them are better than others. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Um, So you're a refugee from Eritrea living in the UK. Yeah. Let's talk about that. First, I think a lot of people probably don't know where Eritrea is. I do because I grew up with one of those um, um, showers that had the map on it, you know, the shower curtain. So I, I'd like to think I know where all my countries are, most of them. But for people that don't know, where is Eritrea? Uh, it's in East Africa, next to the Red Sea. So just uh, next to Ethiopia and South Sudan. Let's talk about what being a refugee was like for you. When did you come? When did you go to the UK? How old were you? And what were the circumstances surrounding your need to depart your home country? Um, So I pretty much actually traveled to about two countries before I came to the UK. So when I was about 10, uh, my mother, who lived in Italy at this time, she thought it would be best if I um, moved away from Eritrea and just kind of come live with her in Europe just because um, in Eritrea, when you hit the age of 18, you have to join the military. Whether that's your woman or man, you don't really have a say in it. Unless, obviously, you get married and have children, then you might not be um, requ- required to join. So my dad was in the army at this time, and he said, look, the best thing to do would be for her to leave the country just gave, because it gave me more choices, I guess, to be able to have a more better life. So when I was about 10, my mom... Um, got my passport and things like that sorted and took me to Italy. When I was in Italy with her, she wasn't able to look after me with, um, because she had to make money and there was no one else to have a look look after me because I was quite young. So I went to a boarding school where with the nuns, Italian nuns. It was quite cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I pretty much, yeah, it was a Catholic because well, so I'm an Orthodox. So I went to like a Catholic um, nun. So I lived there with them from Monday to Friday and then Saturday and Sunday I would see my mom. And yeah, so from Italy, then after a year, um, she decided that actually there isn't really much options here because I think there was a lot of racism within Italy. There wasn't much choices for her to go anywhere. She was working for an old lady, just being her carer. And um, she kind of knew that, look, the education wasn't that well for me anyway. So she decided then to travel to France. And then we lived in France for about a couple of months there. And I lived in the, the, I'm not sure if you know about the jungle in Calais, where most refugees kind of reside. Mm-hmm. So what happened is when you're in France, um, um, my, I think my mom tried to get me to come to the UK, but there was, I don't know what happened, but she couldn't get me papers basically to go to um, um, to the UK legally. So we had to do things illegally, which me- meant camping in those um, jungle, Calais. And it's in Calais in, Par- uh, in France. But it was a, like a place called, we called it the jungle because it looked like the jungle. And there was a lot of refugees who came from different countries who would reside there until they can illegally come into the UK or wherever um, the lorries or went. So... We stayed there for about a couple of months, so that meant like camping outside, and it was cold. I remember that's one thing I remember. I was 11 at this time, but I think I remember it quite well just because 
the cold was horrendous and I've never had to live outside. Even when I was in Eritrea, very deprived country, I've never had to live outside. So the fact that for, for about two, two, three months, I'm sure, we lived in the camp site. So they would have loads of charities come in and give us food. And yeah, and then mom had to like kind of save up enough money to pay the smugglers to kind of help us be smuggled into the UK by lorry. And yeah, for the lorry, after like hours of traveling, we got to the UK. What was it? Not like- that we knew it was going to go to the UK. We didn't know where the lorry was going. We just hoped it was going for the UK. And I, I don't know if I'm familiar with the word. Are you saying lorry? Lorry, as in mm, ha- lorries. You know those big vans that have like loads of food items or freezing oh, food that okay. go kind of take the long journeys. So you and your mom are in um, the refugee camp in, in France, and you find somebody to smuggle you to to smuggle you in that big truck to the UK. Yeah. Oh, my stepdad was with my mom. And then my mom at this time, she was about seven months pregnant. Wow. Crazy, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and to be honest, all this time I was quite 11, so I wasn't questioning a lot of things. And I wasn't allowed to ask questions. I had to just do as I was told. I think it was only later on when I was about 16, 17, I started to understand the reality of how I got to, to be here. Yeah. What was that day like? Do you remember it? You said you have kind of a memory of that day, like waking up. Did your mom say, hey, we're going to go on an adventure? Or did your mom say, just listen to me, we're going somewhere? Or how did that how did that work? I mostly remember it being very bitter, my mom, just because um, I, I was raised by my grandmother and my father back in Eritrea. So I didn't really um, have a much relation with my mom. It's only when I was about 10, out of nowhere, they were like, oh, yeah. This is your mother. She's going to take you to Italy. And that was that. So obviously I was already upset that she's taking me from my country to Italy, to a country I've never been. I've never even left Eritrea. So you can imagine how confused I was. So when I was living in Italy with her, um, I enjoyed being with the nuns because I felt more like they, they wanted me to be there where her, I was just like, I don't like you. You know, it took us about at least a couple of years to kind of build that relationship. However, all I was told it was, we're going to go to the UK for a better life. Obviously, I wasn't sure how we were going to make the journey until we went to um, France. And then from France, they said, yeah, we're going to go jump in those lorries. It was going to take us there. But when they were talking to me about it, they made it sound almost like it was OK to what we were doing. You know, and obviously I didn't ask questions and they made it clear from the beginning as well. I wasn't allowed to ask questions. And as I was a kid, you know, they just said, look, just do as you're told. When you say jump, you jump. When we say duck, you duck, you know. And there was a lot of ducking and jumping. (laughs) So, you know. Wow. The day that you were told you were going to be going to the UK, um, I want to, if you can remember, walk me through that experience. Like from the time you wake up, you said you were sort of bitter with your mom because she's making you move again to an unknown place. And what was that experience like? You, you literally get in the back of a, of a truck with a bunch of people and hope for the best. Talk to me about that. Um, it's very fuzzy in regards to how we came about in Paris. But I do remember um, us taking a few things. It wasn't like she said, we don't need loads of things, you know? So I remember just taking um, spare clothes, And then we got to uh, France and France for about two days. We stayed in a hotel. So I thought, oh, this is cool in a hotel. Nice. You know, I've never been in a hotel myself, you know. So that was quite cool. And then obviously I think after two days of eating nice breakfast, French food, that was lovely. Um, We had to all of a sudden and we just kind of left the hotel and went to a campsite. And I remember loads of people like tents, you know, and like there was loads of kids playing around, um, loads of like dirty things around. I just couldn't. I was just like, okay, what's going on? Didn't ask again because obviously my mom made it clear that I'm not really allowed to ask questions. And if so, I knew that I wasn't going to get answers from her, you know. 
So um, we went to the camp and then we got settled in and we got to speak to other people. There was loads of people there from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan. There was loads of literally loads of people, mostly men. And there were some women with the kids, um, loads of yeah, young men, older men. And um, we stayed there for, for a while, so day in, day out. And I do remember my mom and my stepdad having conversation with different men, but I wasn't sure, obviously, who the men were. Uh, but I'm guessing this would be arrangements to say, look, this is how it works. You know, you would have to uh, go to this location, within that location, hide out until we find appropriate lorry that when the driver's not looking, we have to jump. I do remember having a few tries to get into them. There was a few of them where as soon as we opened the door, the drivers clock, uh, realized that the door has been open. And obviously I think that area was quite a hot spot for people trying to get into the lorry. So they were quite aware. There was time when we got chased by the police because they called the police and the police were chasing us. Um, I remember one time we got caught, me, me and there was another little boy with us who we got, when we got caught by the police, uh, my mom and my stepdad, they managed to um, escape, but me and the boy never ended up escaping. So we got caught by the police and they took us to the hospital. And I think on the hospital, I think they were trying to call um, social services, I'm pretty sure. But me and him, we were not waiting to find out. We said, no, we are not allowed to get caught. So we kind of ran off and somehow managed to find ourselves back into the uh, the campus. The campus, the camp. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, but I do remember the day that we did actually manage to get into the lorry safe and sound when um, I remember we had to like hide behind the scattered rock and, you know, under a bridge. And that was a long way because that's when I think I, I actually froze. Like I felt my whole body shiver. And I remember having such a frostbite so I couldn't feel my feet at one point, you know. And um, yeah, so he was like, yeah, go. So we remember just having to quickly sneak in behind other cars. And then um, as soon as he opened the lorry, we went into the lorry. Obviously, we wasn't sure what's inside the lorry. We were fortunate enough to end up in a lorry that had loads of onions, like the lorry was full of onions. But I heard from other people's stories that they have been in a situation where it was a frozen one with frozen food. And they've had to stay in those frozen food until it arrived in the destination, you know. So we were fortunate enough to have onion. But I'm being scarred for life because I can't stand onions now. Like every time I see onion, I'm like, ah, oh, memories, <laughs> you know, wow. horrible. Wow. But yeah. And you're 11. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. And now did your mom make it on the same truck, the lorry, as you? Or, cause yeah, I, luckily, yeah. Yeah, she and she's did, pregnant. Luckily. Yeah, her and my stepdad and another boy with us, we managed to make it into the lorry all together. We was quite lucky because, you know, some any of us could have been left behind. Yeah, we did make it. And then obviously when we got to the, halfway through the journey, um, they do make loads of stops. So halfway through the journey, I remember being told to hold your breath in almost like you're dead just because they were testing our heat bodies or breathing. I don't know how they did it, but I know that they said um, – hold your breath in. If not, they are going to catch us and like kick us out. And because between the onions, they were like gaps. So we were able to kind of fit ourselves in them. So anybody that opened the lorry wouldn't think anybody's inside. Wow. So you're literally hiding in a huge truck of onions. Yeah. Like it was full. I wouldn't like onions after that either. (laughs) I know exactly. I think about it now. Every time I look at an onion, I'm like, I wonder who's been with, like, because there was time where we was in there for a long time and we had water with us, obviously, to keep hydrated. And I'm not going to lie to you. I, we kind of did wee wee on the side. So, you know, <laughs> watch out for your onions. <laughs> watch them twice. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your sense of humor during this story because it's just insane to me. So, but you have to cross through, you have to go through the, I mean, you have to, England's an island. How did you get, did you get on a boat after? No, the lorry, I don't, the lorry might have, I don't know. I've, until this day, I'm, I've never fi- like really figured it out because I never really thought to look back on my journey, how that made it. But I'm pretty sure it probably has, you know, could have, right? Maybe. I have. I don't, I don't know. I'm just trying to like paint a picture in my head because it sounds crazy. And, and I've, other stories I've heard of people getting smuggled into other countries, they're always 
mind blowing. And there's so many chances that you could get caught or die during the process. And just to think about the luck that you made it is Mm -hmm. crazy, especially as a little 11 year old girl who is so unfamiliar with the territory. And also you said you didn't really have much of a relationship with your mom. So it's so hard to even trust that. And here she is putting you in danger. But but ultimately, she's trying to save your life, too, though. Right. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Because obviously, again, my mom, she, before she got to Italy, she did go through the Mediterranean countries illegally as well. Mm-hmm. So I can only imagine what kind of journey she took to get to Italy and then from for her to go to Italy and be like, OK, this is still not good enough for whatever reason, most of the time there was no jobs and there wasn't much better life for me regardless as she thought this would be the only way to go to another country where there will be more opportunities. And there has been a lot of opportunities since I've got here, you know, despite everything else that's happened. Right. So unfortunately, obviously, um, <clears throat> once we um, arrived to the UK at the borders, um, they, they parked at this area when they were, I'm not sure if they knew someone was in there, but somehow I feel like they didn't know someone was in there because the police came in seconds. As soon as the door opened, the police were there and they took took us all in and I ended up being in a prison cell for about 24 hours. That was horrible. Like I thought, oh my God. So not only did I travel all this way here, but now I'm by myself, not with mom, no one, you know, and in that prison cell was horrible. I don't think I ever want to go to prison in my life. Like it's horrendous. And yeah, now they gave me some horrible food. It was disgusting. And the toilet there, stiff beds, you know. And yeah, no, I didn't see my mom after that because obviously once... Um, um, the police came and then they arrested us. We were in prison cell for about 24 hours. And a lady from social services came and then kind of took me. So they must have called, uh, social services got called and then they called a foster carer to come and collect me and the boy for the night until they could figure out what we, they were going to do with us. Um, fortunate enough, the lady had enough bed, a bedroom for me to stay if I wanted to stay. And I ended up staying with her for about six years. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I didn't expect the story. Did you like her? Was she nice? She was so lovely. Like, um, I didn't speak a word of English. I only spoke, I spoke Italian, I spoke French, and I spoke Tigrinya, which is my language. But English, she wasn't one of them. <laughs> so, we, I, like, for the first few months, it was really hard to communicate because, obviously, I didn't know what was happening. I wanted to know where my mom was, uh, you know. I wanted to know who, where the, who the people I came with, where they at, you know. I was literally just on my own. And, obviously, when I got arrested, before we got arrested, well, should, should I say court? Uh, we got told basically don't say nothing don't speak to no one like just act like you can't hear see nothing you know what I mean so we were pretty much unable to speak even if we wanted to speak and say this what happened to us you know so the lady kind of made it easy for me to ask me questions like what do you want to eat how do you like your bread or how do you like your breakfast what clothes do you want to wear where do you want to sleep that kind of thing rather than being like where did you come from what happened and stuff like that so she made it she wasn't interrogating me like the police were in a sense so I felt more kind of comfortable and safe with her knowing that okay she's not asking me all these questions like the police are and for a few months I was asked a lot of questions by home office police officers social services again like not word of English so I had a translator and within the translator she couldn't get much out of me because I didn't know too much and I think they probably made sure that I didn't know too much for this purpose reasons Right. And also, I'm sure you were afraid to talk since everybody told you not to say anything, too. So, yeah, I was scared to go back home. Yeah. Right. So you're you're 11 and you've now been smuggled into a new country where you don't know the language. You have a crazy experience getting there and then you go right to jail. And yeah, how traumatic. Geez. And then and but look at you, you sound so happy. And you look so amazing and beautiful. And, and you said you're a mom. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second, too, because I, I really want to hear what happened, you know, after you said this really nice woman came to the jail and met you and saw you and just took you in. And that was and she was allowed to sort of, I guess, be your foster mom then? Obviously, because when um, the police were asking my, my, me and the boy that we came with, because he was about 14, 
they were asking us questions about how we came here, who did we come here with, and um, they realised that actually we don't, we don't have anyone to look after us. There must have been the reasons why then they afford the need to call such services. Even if we did have somebody we knew, they would still have to take, just make sure, because we were kids, you know, we were at the end of the age, under the age of 18, just okay. to be for the safety reasons. But um, when she came and collected me, honestly, I felt a little bit safer because she was not like she wasn't my mom or my stepdad who were going to take me again. So my fear was like, OK, they're going to take me somewhere again just to run away from the police because we did that again. You know, when we was in Paris, uh, in France, sorry, um, we did end up running away from the police. So the idea of having to run away again, I did not like. <laughs> so when I was in a, with this woman who ended up having to take me and, you know, and just I felt a little bit safer, I guess. Good. So just to clarify, too, had you stayed in Eritrea, you would have had to do two years in the military at 18 or be married, right? Like both those um, outcomes are pretty grim. Well, unfortunately, in Eritrea, there is not two years. I wish there was. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there really isn't. Yeah, like um, it could be many years. They they get to decide what to do with it. Like, for example, uh, my cousin now, um, he turned 18 and he went to the military. And I think after about three years or something like that, he managed um, to come out of it because he like he finished his degree and, and things like that. So he was able to like come out of it and join like a, he joined a bank. Mm-hmm. where other young people wouldn't have had the chance. So I think it is the, the military that decide what to do with you. So you can be there for years and years, like my dad was. My dad, he's been in the military since he was a kid and he's like in his 50s, you know what I mean? So they get to decide what to do with you. There isn't much you deciding after two years you come out. No, I think that's what my, my dad didn't want to do. He's like, there is no way she's going to join the army and the militaries if we have another way of doing it. And I think that's when my mom, you know, was like, okay. So, uh, so when did you start communicating with your mom again after you'd been sort of legally, I guess, adopted by that foster woman? When did you, when were you able to connect back with her? Um, when I was about 17, turning 18. Mm-hmm. And that happened by chance, to be honest. That it wasn't even a thing because I didn't know where she was. But I had an uncle here who lived here before I came here. Um, when I told the social services eventually, like, look, I have an uncle here. They contacted him and said, look, we have a we have a girl here who claims to be your niece. Whatever, whatever, you know. And then he ended up um, not taking me just because I think they were requiring of him to have certain amount of money and a house that he, that was with two bedrooms. And if he didn't, I wasn't able to kind of live with him. And he was, he didn't have a job, like a proper job. And then, then the extra room for me to go and live with him. So they let me uh, have a contact with him, like visit contact. So the social worker had to be there every time we visited. And he lived about 10 hour drive from where I lived. And, and I lived in London and he lived in Plymouth. That was literally, I think about 10 hours away from London. So we had to see each other like maybe every six months or things like that. And while we was doing that, he had um, from because the Eritrean community are quite good with each other all around the whole country. So he found out that my mom was living somewhere else, which was like I think about eight, is that six, seven hours away from where I lived as well. So we were able to kind of have contact that way. And obviously, I, when I was about 17, I left um, my foster carer to go and live in like a semi, uh, semi-accommodation. So you can go and live with other children who are in care, like in a shared house until you're about 18, 19, and then you can do your own house. So I lived in a shared accommodation and then I thought, okay, I get more freedom in this way, you know, like that way nobody's monitoring who I go see and whatnot. And that's when I got in contact with my mom and we said let's make this work and see if we can see each other even though she lives so far away from me so you hadn't seen your mom since since you got taken from the truck of onions for you said about six six six-ish years six seven years yes and you had no idea if she was alive and she had no idea if you were alive yeah yeah pretty much yeah wow 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 how is your relationship with your mom now is going. Okay. okay. <laughs> Not the greatest. 
obviously for a lot of reasons but obviously because I have a child now so I and I understand a little bit more I'm more a bit more forgiving now realizing that mom had to do what she had to do to make sure that I got out of the country that weren't gonna you know let me stay in the military and do whatever with me you know I understand she did what she has to do as a parent it doesn't make it any easier because obviously I've had to grow up without a mother anyways. I've not seen my mom since I was two before I even went to live with her in Italy. So you can imagine like the whole connection was never there. So for me to kind of completely cut her off, it was just like, no, I need to kind of give her a chance, explain what, what was the reason she did what she did. And obviously my mom has been traumatized from a lot of things because not only what, what happened to us in Paris, but obviously before she went to Italy, she did go to other countries like Lib- Lib- Lebanon, Lib- Lebanon, yeah, Lebanon, yeah. Turkey, and other countries as well. And I don't that even that she traveled illegally as well. So you can imagine what horrendous things she must have seen to get to where it is. Only for her to come back for me and bring me in a journey to be in a safer country. So I can't fault her, but obviously I got a lot of um, forgiving, a lot of healing to do from all that. Have you been able to keep in touch with your dad? Because you said you were pretty close with him and your grandma in Eritrea uh, from you saw him, you raised you till you were, went to Italy, right? Yeah, I've always contacted him. Uh, one thing about my foster care as well, she made sure I called back home all the time. So I think every week I used to call. It's only when I moved out and I was living the life of a teenager, free, <laughs> that I kind of stopped calling less and less. But in 2019... I um, received some good news that I can start applying for my uh, British passport, but I just had to apply for neutralization, which cost like 1,400 or something like that. And then from that, you have to take a test to say, you know, you're, you know the British language very well and the culture. And then from then you can apply for your British passport. So, it, in 2019, I remember calling my dad and saying, look, look finally, I'm going to come back home because all this time I wasn't allowed back home. And uh, we were making, started making plans and I, I applied for neutralization, sent the application off. But unfortunately, um, sorry. That's okay. Yeah, it's just like his anniversary is next year, like the year of him passing next month. Mm-hmm. So it's still kind of like, I'm still dealing with it but I haven't said that in so long now I've just said I'm like oh when was the last time you saw him was it when you were 10 yeah Yeah. I just got upset just because obviously um over the years uh, he can understand how why it took me so long to go back home and obviously I told him look there's a lot of immigration issues in the country and plus social services before I turned 18 they never resolved my documents for whatever reason I didn't think anything of it because the whole time I was able to go to college I was able to do whatever I wanted to do so I never understood that I needed to sort it out so by the time I figured it out it turns out actually they, they could have saved me a lot of hustle and I could have seen him a lot sooner but he's always said to me, like, you're going to are you going to come when I die? And I didn't think that would be true. So I think when I s- started speaking about it, I was like, yeah, it's true. It came true what he said, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't my fault. That took me so long to go back, you know. Right. Right. No, not your fault at all. Have you been back to Eritrea? Can you can you said you got most of your paperwork done now? Can you travel and have you been back? Well, um, the good news is, obviously, when I got everything clarified and everything was in January last year, in 2020, when they said, yeah, now we just have to um, I apply for my neutralization, did the test, and then COVID happened. So they had to delay my whole document until about, when was it, last month is when I actually got a call saying, look, everything's been successful. You can apply for your British passport now where... You have to get like a certificate first to say you've been neutralized. So last month I got neutralized. That was nice because now I'm fully British. So this is nice. (laughs) Finally, after 15 years, I get my Yeah. Do you want to go back to Eritrea? Definitely. Yeah, 100% because I'm excited to go and see my grandma. It's unfortunate I can't see my dad, but... I feel like my grandma is still there who also raised me. So I am excited. I think that's the first country I'm going to visit once lockdown gets lifted. Because right now in Eritrea, they've locked everything off. 
Oh, okay. What country feels like home to you? Um, oh, that's a hard one. Really hard because obviously I've been here for over 15 years, but um, it doesn't feel like a home for me here. Even though I've, I've lived here almost my, ch- my childhood and I'm living my adult life here. But I feel like there's a lot of unfinished business back home. So maybe when I go back home, I might just get a sense of... I know that when I go back home, I'm not going to really belong there just because obviously I speak the language quite broken. And people are going to know that I'm not... I'm, I'm, I'm from Europe. It's quite easy to... Like, the people back home will know that, you know, I'm not from Eritrea. But I feel like, if, even regardless of that, I feel like that will probably give me the answers. I think I will know the answers there where I belong. But until then, I'm I'm not really sure where I belong. Have you experienced a lot of discrimination? Um, yeah, 100% sure. It was a lot more worse, I guess, when I was in school. Because obviously, I had to speak English from scratch and I had an accent. And I feel like I have still an accent now. People sometimes be like, you sound so British. But then sometimes you have people saying, oh, you sound like you're from somewhere. Where are you from? But yeah, definitely, people do, do kind of discriminate here 100%. Maybe a lot of it is quite subtle. So you don't know if it is racism or discrimination, whatever you're like. Mm, it takes you a minute to think about it, but it is definitely here. Mm. What do you think some common misconceptions are about you and refugees? I feel like there's a lot of talk about refugees and stuff. What do you feel like some common misconceptions are? Um, quite often, um, people say... Um, I'm here to take the jobs. I'm here to kind of just live off benefits and things like that. But most of us can't even claim benefit when we come here. So clearly it's not for benefits. Mm. And um, we do, obviously, we come here for better life because obviously in our country is deemed to be unsafe. You know, there's a lot of things happening. There's other people who are running away from war. I was fortunate enough that I didn't get to, that to see that side of it where a war broke out, where you look at Eritrea now, there's actually war happening. You know, so imagine I was back home now, there would be a full-blown war. And quite often, it's quite hard to explain it to them and say, look, we are here because our country is not giving us the freedom or the resources or the, the things we need to do to achieve or live a better life, you know, and essentially. So when we come here, that's all we came here for, for a better life. And most of us, don't want to leave you know like who would want to leave everything about their home their loved one their family to be here for what reasons you know right it's the same thing like when this whole corona broke down i said to people like look at this if you got told there's a country somewhere with no corona is safe you all can go there would we be the first people to pack our bags and go there Right. Why? Because we're running away from something that's deadly. It's the same thing back home. That obviously everything is deadly. That's why we come here. It's not because we want we enjoy traveling and being away from our loved ones, from everything that we know. You know, and quite often once we come to the UK, we have to kind of uh, not even just the UK, any other Europe countries, any other countries. Once we immigrate there, we have to lend a language and speak like them, walk like them, do everything like them, just to fit in. Even then, we don't fit in. And for them to turn around and say, you're here because you want to take away what we have, it's like, we don't have a choice. That's why we're here. And I think that's one of the main things that I always tell people. I didn't come here by choice. There was no choice. The choice was made for me by the government or whatever, whoever, to, whoever decided to ruin my country. That's why we're here. You know, obviously, obviously my, my parents too. <laughs> they decided that this would be the best thing to do. That gives me chills that you said that beautifully, beautifully. Thank you. What do you want people to know about you? I am a refugee. You know, I'm no longer a refugee now because I've been given the status, but I feel like even given the status, you still bring that, like the, 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 the memories with you, knowing that you left your country or another country that you didn't want to be in, but you feel like it's the only way to be in. So I guess, yeah, a refugee, a foster care, a foster care, I guess, um, young person. But, all those things, they are me, but they are they don't limit me from what I need to be. I guess that's what it is. You can put me in every box you want just so it can make sense to people. But 
I feel like I will still keep pushing because that's what I'm here for. It would almost feel like if I don't keep pushing and take every opportunity that come my way, it would be almost like I did all this for nothing. Yeah. To be away from loved ones, to be away from what I know and grew up, you know, to be in, if it wasn't for the better good. Right. I guess as just a refugee as a general, again, I feel I can't stress enough to highlight that we left our belongings, our homes to be somewhere we, we deemed is much more safer. So if people are going to keep unwelcoming us, they need to stop um, starting a war or, you know, other things like that back home. And that's the only way to stop people from coming to other countries. Yeah, I think I just wanted to say that. And I think, again, if every single one of us were put in this position, we would find somewhere to go to be safe. So why is that any different from anyone trying to do the same thing from their back home to be elsewhere? I agree 100 percent. 100%. Florida, I just want to say thank you again. You are beautiful, and I genuinely loved talking to you. If you ever make it to America, I hope you connect with me. I would love to show you around. Your son can play with my sons, and and I won't give you any onions. My sister hates onions, too, with a passion. (laughs) So I will make an onion-free dish, and we'll, we'll celebrate life together. I'm sure whatever you do in the future will be fabulous. You just radiate positivity and, and goodness. So I'm rooting for you and I'll be keeping an eye out for you. And I hope our paths cross in real life one day. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big believer in that. What is meant to be will be. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. It was lovely chatting to you. And I'm also, I appreciate it to be given the platform to be able to speak because I think quite often refugees, they don't get to hear they, they say just because they don't speak the language. So that it's almost like, or they have nothing to say, but they have so much to say, but they're just afraid. And I work quite a lot of young people who are refugees trying to be their voice and say, look, just because they're not saying they don't need it doesn't mean they don't need it. It's just that they don't know how to ask for it or they don't think that they're entitled to these things. So I'm quite often advocating for that. So it's quite nice to be on another big platform to do that. Amazing. Amazing. I love it. Keep doing what you're doing. You're fabulous. And like I said, I hope I get to meet you in real life one day. Definitely. I am planning to come to America. That is my plan because I want to go to Florida and I've been named Florida and I've not even been there. So it's a must. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you later. All right, you two. Take care. Bye. Bye.